So I waited for the biopsy report and there was no cancer. Mike, how did you find Carnival? You know, I completely stumbled upon it. Um, <clears throat> I was having the usual old farts, urinary problems about 18 months ago. And I'd had all these scans and they're all pointing at my prostate saying, oh, your prostate's enlarged, you know, and, and that's normal. You know, everyone your age has an enlarged prostate, which I now realise isn't true. Um, so as you do, I got onto Dr. YouTube and started searching for stuff to do with prostate, you know. And I came across Dr. Berg, who has a, a video about shrinking your prostate. And I thought, well, what have I got to lose, you know? Um, things can't get any worse. So I followed his advice, which was cut out the carbs, or the sugars in particular, and take zinc and vitamin B1. So I bought zinc and vitamin B1, and to my utter amazement, within two days, I stopped getting up in the middle of a pee. And I thought, that's just unbelievable. I can't have shrunk my prostate that quick, you know, like, <laughs> uh, it's impossible. Um, but I, I went back to being normal and I just couldn't believe it. So I, I started watching more videos of Dr. Berg's because he was the only one that I actually knew about at that time. And I was sort of, I was getting on to Christmas and I, he, he has recipes on how to make, desserts that are keto and all this kind of stuff. And I, and I sort of fell for that. Um, and I'm, I made, so I made my first keto, because I really like cooking, by the way. I made my first keto Christmas dinner. And we had a guest here and my wife. And it was really nice. Um, and everything seemed to be going well. Um, and, and I thought I was fixed, actually. Except I still couldn't believe that I could possibly shrink my prostate in two days. And it turns out, so I live on a farm, I also have to add. So I've, we've got a thousand apple trees on this farm and lots of other things that are growing here. We used to grow all our own vegetables, all organic, but we also grow our own wheat, meat, I might add. We've, we've, had, we've grown lamb, pork, um, goat, we've got chickens and ducks. And, and so... I, I feel that I was eating well to start with. In fact, being here, I almost feel like a fraud because, to be perfectly honest, after the stories I've heard from you, some of your people, I, I was in really good health. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, was I started losing weight, which is not why I went on the keto diet to begin with. It was just like a pleasant side effect. After a while, my wife said to me, You've lost weight, you know, and I had to, I actually had to buy braces to hold my, my trousers up because I went from a size thirty six to a size thirty two. I only lost twelve kilos, so compared to people who've lost one hundred and twenty kilos, you know, I, I can't boast about huge amounts of weight loss. But what happened was that around Easter time, which is when the fruit season starts, I um, I started eating apples, you know, like we've got delicious organic apples growing on the tree. You just pick the apple, you know, crunch on it. And, and I don't know, I ate a dozen apples. And the next thing you know, all my urinary problems came back, like really bad. Like my urine looked like Coca-Cola. And um, I couldn't believe it. So I went to the doctors and I had a urinary tract infection. By the way, before, before I went on Dr. Berg's regime, I had chronic urinary tract infections, which, you know, blokes like us aren't supposed to get. So I used to get one like every, well, it feels like every month. I'd, so I'd be on antibiotics, which I hate taking antibiotics. Anyway, this was much worse because my urine went nearly black. So I went to the doctor. She gave me more antibiotics. And she said, look, you can't keep this up. You have to go and see a urologist. And I thought, well, yeah, what else can I do? So she made an appointment. Or she, anyway, I went to the urologist and he checked me out. And he said, all right, we, we need to do a cystoscopy, which is not pleasant. Uh, so I went to the hospital. You now they, they stick a thing up your unmentionables and 
they take pictures and they dig around and take samples and and um, and I'll, they knock you right out, so you don't know anything about it until afterwards. And um, and when I came to, he came and saw me and he said, "Well, he said there's no way that your prostate is causing you the problem. He said it's nowhere near big enough to cause you any problems." Oh, well, maybe I have shrunk it, but he said, "But but the thing is." You know, we won't know because they, they thought I had cancer. So that was a big worry. They thought I had bladder cancer. So they took samples because I, well, I'm sort of skimming, skipping around the place. But on one side of the bottom of my bladder was a lot thicker than the other side, which is why they thought there must have been a tumour there. And what that's causing is it's pushing one side across and blocking the urethra. So it stops you from peeing and then, and you can't empty your bladder. Well, I couldn't empty my bladder properly. That's what the urologist said. And if urine stays in there, it sloshes around, and that's where all the bugs have a tendency to grow and cause all these problems. So I waited for the biopsy report, and there was no cancer. And, in fact, they said, we don't know what it is. I, by the time I'd reached that stage, I'd been watching Richard Fiend's videos about cancer and sugar, I think his name's Richard Fiennes, the, the professor who specialises in cancer treatment with ketogenic therapies. <clears throat> and uh, he he said, you know, you, if you starve the cancer from sugar and, and glucose, you, you you can beat the cancer. And uh, so I, I have no proof because I didn't have a biopsy before I, I went on the keto diet. I've got a theory though that maybe I got it really early. because I mean, some of the people on... YouTube, you know, they've had stage four colon cancer and brain tumors and like really serious problems. And I think if I got it really early, I might have been able to just knock it off before it got a chance to, to get a hold of me. Um, and, and typically, you know, after I went for my second visit to the urologist, when he talked to me about the fact that they couldn't find cancer, I said to him, well, I don't think cancer can live in my body because I've completely cut out all the sugars. And he just rolled his eyes. You know, what? this is what doctors do. They just roll their eyes. And my, my local doctor, the one, the one that prescribes all the antibiotics, you know, she just rolls her eyes whenever I mention the diet. Um, and I went, I went for ages. I was actually passing clots, probably because they'd been digging around inside my bladder. And, you know, it, and... And then I, I became quite obsessive about testing my urine because I, I, I'm quite scientifically minded, really. And I, I need to know what's going on, especially when it comes to my health. Yeah? So I bought these dipsticks. You, I don't know if you know about them. You, you put them in your urine and there's all these color patches on it and it tells you what's wrong. And for ages I had glucosides, which is you know white blood cells, which means there's an infection and quite a bit of protein. And But the big thing was there was a lot of blood. Now, you, you can't actually see it, um, but there's a patch on the stick which is, which is green. And like six months ago, you, I'd put it in, and, it would, and you're supposed to wait 60 seconds before you can actually match it to the color chart that comes with the sticks. It would go instant black. And which is like way off the chart because the darkest color is actually dark green. And for months, it just it would just go black. Like it was just off the – and the urologist couldn't he, – he couldn't tell me what was wrong. He'd never come across anything like it really, I suppose. And, and then it came relatively good. Like all, all the patches became normal except for the blood one, which was – I've had blood in my urine for – Four months or more, probably, because that's when I started testing it. Um, and then this Christmas that we've just had, I did another keto dinner, and I made a dessert with zarithritol, and and I stupidly also drank a glass of wine. My wife poured a glass of wine, and instead of saying, "Oh no, I can't drink that," because I stopped think, drinking alcohol as well, I drank it. The very next day. Like all back to really bad. Like I just couldn't believe it. Not again. <laughs> and so, of course, 
Christmas is a really bad time to get sick because everything is shut. You know, the doctor's shut, so I had to put up with it for a while. I went to the doctor. She gave me more antibiotics. And they started working for three days and then everything got bad again. So I had to go back and get a different kind. And I was on antibiotics for two months. And I hate the bloody things. I hate being on antibiotics. But eventually it settled down. And I've been good now for about six weeks. All the symptoms have gone. And uh, the only thing that I still have now is blood. But to my amazement, in the last week, the, the level of blood content is dropping like nearly every day. And I've got this theory that all this was caused by the chronic inflammation from the carbs and that I'm actually healing myself. That's what I'm actually hoping for. Since seeing the local doctor who rolls her eyes at me, I've, um, I've found a keto doctor. Now, here in Australia, we've got this low-carb down under that's run by Paul Mason. I think it's Paul Mason who runs it. And you can actually search for local doctors that, you know, will treat you like you're not stupid. Anyway, I found, I found this uh, Dr. Elliot in Hobart. Uh, it's, you know, it's a 65-kilometre trip, which is that's the bad part, to go to the doctor. Um, and I had a lengthy uh, talk with her, and she said, well, you know, You've been abusing your body with carbs for decades and um, it's not going to fix itself overnight. So, so what I'm planning to do now with her, I, I'm going to wait until like I have had no UTIs for like two months at least, which will be a bit of a record for quite some time. And then I want to get another scan of my bladder and to see, to see if, that sh if that thickening is shrunk. And maybe because it's oh, over six months since I had my last scan, and hopefully my, my prostate shrunk as well because I'm passing urine quite normally now. I, I even have like pelvic floor uh, control. I can actually push urine out now, whereas I couldn't before. Um, so that's so I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that um, it's going to fix itself. Now, I, you know, I, I used to eat some sugars. You know, like I remember before all this started, before the before seeing Dr. Berg, um, we would eat chocolate in front of the TV before going to bed and this kind of stuff. You know, and, and but it wasn't much. You know, and I'm, I haven't had sugar in my coffee for years. Um, occasionally, my wife would buy some biscuits, and that's probably about the only other sugar that I'd have. But but we used to eat a lot of bread and pasta and rice and potatoes and all the usual stuff, which I've completely cut out now. In fact, I, I cut all that out as soon as I saw Dr. Berg's video or videos because obviously I, I saw many more after watching the Shrink Your Prostate one. And I started noticing all these improvements and all sorts of other things, like the joint the joint pain, I mean, everyone talks about joint pain going away. But like about two or three years ago, we re-roofed our shed. It's a really big shed. And I hired a builder because there's no way I was going to climb on the roof. So he was jumping around like a monkey up there. But I was passing all the sheets up. And you know, big, six meter long sheets of corrugated iron, they're, they're not light. I mean, I'm a very active bloke. And then on the last day, we had to do the other side which was much higher, and he brought these trestles, painter's trestles are like 3.6 metres high, and the rungs are about three feet apart. So climbing those, you've got to lift your foot right up, you know, and at the end of the day, my knees were wrecked. Like I could hardly walk, actually, for about two weeks. It took me two weeks to get over it, and I was pretty really worried I wasn't going to get over it. And then the knee pain just got worse and worse, and I thought I, was, I reached the stage... 18 months ago before I switched to keto that maybe I'll have to contemplate, contemplate um, a knee replacement surgery. Anyway, I don't even think about my knees anymore. <laughs> the pain is completely gone. All the arthritis in my hands is gone. And I've worked out that that was actually caused by tomatoes. I'm quite sure it's caused by tomatoes. The lectins in tomatoes are causing it. Because 
when I stopped eating pasta, I obviously stopped eating tomato sauce that went with it. I used to make my own tomato sauce from my own organic tomatoes, and like, and I didn't put any sugar in. Um, but like Dr. Chafee says, you know, plants are out to kill you. Um, and and then, like lately, I've been. You know, you don't think about these things. You think, I don't smell anymore. I've got no body odor. I've got no bad breath either. My gums are growing back. You know, ten years ago, before coming to Tasmania, I, my dentist in Queensland said to me, "Oh, you've got gum disease, and it's normal. You know, people your age get gum disease." And and I had two really loose back teeth. Like you could rock them by just pushing back and forth with my finger. And he said, one day they'll just fall out. I thought, oh, great. But they're not loose anymore. And, you know, after watching Jordan Peterson on, on YouTube, he, he talks about the same thing. He's, he's, had, he's actually had gum disease way longer than me. And, and I'm thinking, well, everyone tells you that these things are normal. It's just a normal part of aging. But it's rubbish. No one has to be like this. You don't have to have knee pain. You don't have to have cancer. You don't have to have any of this stuff. And the one thing, because my wife's on side now, she's joined me on the, she's not quite as strict as me, but she's joined me on, she's at least keto, but she's pretty much carnivore as well. She cheats down and again. And she, she totally agrees that, you know, she's, she feels way better. And the brain fog's lifted. Everyone talks about the brain fog. I hadn't even thought about it until she mentioned it. She said, I've got no brain fog anymore. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, neither have I. Um, and... It's really remarkable how much difference it's made to both of us. Glenda's re acid reflux has disappeared. Um, I've never suffered from that, but that's it's awesome. Uh, you know, the the amazing thing is everyone's got their own story, but the improvements that happen, it always comes together. You know, because it's always things like joint pain, arthritis, gum disease, all all that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I mean, that that's awesome that your prostate was uh, shrank. Well, well, I, I haven't got proof of that yet, but maybe I could come back on and show you my scans when I get them back. <laughs> but the, actually, there's two other things too that because because I was getting blood in my urine, and I've had hypertension too. By the way, I've had hypertension for. 40 years. So I've, I've been on tablet. I'm off them now. Um, I was worried that I was, uh, that I'd damage my kidneys because hypertension can damage your kidneys because even with the tablets, my, my blood pressure was never fantastic. Like 140 on a hundred kind of thing, even with the tablets. So I, I had some blood tests done in August last year. And when I got the results, the doctor called me in and she looked at me and she looked at the results. She said, what did you do? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, your EGFR, which was 65 last time we had tests done, which is borderline kidney disease, is up to 87, which is what you'd expect from someone 40 years younger than you. And, and, uh, and my liver functions were right back to normal, like completely normal. Like, and, and what I realised now, looking back, I've had all these red flags for the last few years because of the fact that I live on a, on an apple farm. Um, if I have fructose, it just wrecks my liver straight away. Like I, I had a blood test done five years ago probably, and the doctor called me and she said, or oh, actually it was a different dog, it was a man at the time. He said, there's something seriously wrong with your liver. Um, what have you done? I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I've eaten lots of apples. <laughs> and he said, well, whatever you've done, he said, you've got to stop. And, and so he booked me in for a test about a month later. So I stopped eating apples. And a month later, my liver functions were fine again. So it's actually oh, – and dates. I used – because dates are supposed to be healthy, aren't they? <laughs> so I had, I had quite a lot of dates as well. So it's the fructose because dates, are the, they've got the highest concentration of fructose of any fruit you can eat apparently. So I'm obviously very intolerant of fructose. And, but the beauty of the liver is an amazing organ, actually. It reacts really quickly, really well to changes that you make to your diet. So I've decided that I'm never going to eat another piece of fruit. It's just not going to happen. 
and it's amazing how people think I'm, I'm crazy. You know, like I tell people, fruit's no bad, no good for you. You know, and they'll say, oh well, there'd be experts who disagree with you. I say, well, I don't care because they're all wrong. <laughs> And, and now I'm absolutely convinced that fruit is bad for you. It's kind, kind of ironic that you're kind of ironic that you're saying that, and you you live on an apple farm. I oh, know. Yeah. Well, see, I, I bought we bought this farm because this is what I want to talk about next. Actually, we bought this farm to get ourselves ready for all sorts of problems coming down the pipeline with food production and food supply. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, I shall. Oh, yeah. The other thing that grows here wild, the blackberries. Now, you know, everyone says, oh, blackberries and blueberries, they're keto. You know, they're fine. You, you can have those. And they've started ripening, so they're all over the place. And, and between the house where I'm in now and, and the shed where I do a lot of work, I've got to walk past all these blackberry vines. So the other day I thought, oh, what could possibly go wrong? You know, I, so I picked a couple of handfuls, you know, like just got them down, did my job. And I put on a kilo and a half. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Like, how can a handful or two of blackberries equate to one and a half kilo weight gain? I couldn't work it out. And then, and then I saw a video just a couple of days ago. I forget who it was now because I'm watching, I'm watching so many videos now. It's crazy. And I've worked out what it happens because – as soon as I have any amount of fructose, because I've probably consumed, I've worked out about 15 grams of carbs from those blackberries. Like it's, in the scheme of things, it's nothing. But that's enough to screw with your satiety hormones, I reckon. And so because I'd eaten those, I reckon I ate more meat and eggs and bacon and whatever than I normally would because I was just feeling a bit more hungry than usual. And also, I, I didn't fast. I, I mean, I fast every day. I, I do 18-hour fast every single day now. But at least twice a week, I'd like to do a 24-hour fast. And I don't force myself to do this. I, I just don't feel hungry. And I think what happened was that the blackberries made me feel hungry enough that I stopped doing the 24-hour fast. And I think I ate more than I usually do. I started snacking on bits of cheese and or the odd macadamia nut too, which I've decided I'm going to stop eating too. Um, and as soon as you start fasting, um, snacking like that, you just put the weight back on. It's gone again. It, mind you, it takes twice as long to get it off as it does to put it on. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer now of, of no carbs. I, I just can't see mm. how carbs are any good at all for you. Mm. Um, now, the other thing, okay, so I mentioned that we bought this farm because of several things. Well, we, we bought the farm because of climate change. We used to live in Queensland. I, I, you're from Australia, so, you know, Queensland's up in the subtropics. Well, we were in the subtropics. <clears throat> and it just got so hot, I just couldn't work there anymore. And I'd been, I'd, I'd actually wanted to move to Tasmania 50 years ago because I just loved the place to death. So we, we decided to move because of climate change. It's much cooler here. I can't stand the heat. Today's really hot. It's going to be 31 degrees today and 35 tomorrow and 20 degrees the next day, fortunately. So I'm pleased about that. Um, so, we, you know, the last farm we had in Queensland, we ran out of water. Here I made sure we had so much water we don't know what to do with. Like if we run out of water, the rest of the world's in real trouble. Um, and also we wanted to grow all our own food. So... So we had plenty of water to do that with, you know, to irrigate and so on. So I set up a market garden um, behind the house, probably nearly half an acre, I reckon. And I, was, I had plans of growing all these veggies and then we've got like probably a dozen fruit trees. This is apart from the apple trees. We've got plums and apricots and, you know, all kinds of things, nut trees. Um, and and the, so the plant – plan was to be self-sufficient in food. So we also grow our own meat. So we've grown pigs and lambs and goats, chickens and ducks, and we, we've killed our own meat. Um, we hardly e ever buy meat from outside, although more so lately because, oh, all sorts of reasons. But uh, actually the butcher is supposed to come very soon and we're probably going to have a dozen lambs and goats in the freezer. So we'll be set for the next 12 months for meat. 
and it's all free range organic grass fed so it's, you know, it's the best quality that you can get now the reason there are several reasons why i wanted to this to do this the main one is peak oil which is which is happening right now so the oil the global oil production is going to drop off from here on and that's going to cause a huge problem for the food production as we have today. So I'm, I'm really big on sustainability. You know? So I've built the house, this house that you can see in the background is a 10-star energy-efficient house that needs no heating or cooling. Um, so if the world fell apart tomorrow, we'd be fine. Thank you very much. Uh, we run on solar power, which is neither here nor there because that's not sustainable either. Um, but what people don't realise is how unsustainable the garbage food production is. Um, and I've known this for 20 years. It's, it's been a well-known fact for a long time in people, at least people in my circle of acquaintances. Now, people don't realise if, if you buy any food from a supermarket, 90% of the calories that are in those foods come directly from fossil fuels. Without fossil fuels, there's no wheat, no grains, no canola oil, no, you know, nothing. It's just there's going to be starvation. That's what's going to happen. And, and to give you a, a classic example, when I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had seed oils in, I don't know, 25, 30 years, maybe longer, because I, I, I love olive oil. Um, but even, and even that I've cut right back on. So I started doing some research about the sustainability of what I was doing now, you know, eating a lot of meat and whatever else. So I thought, well, if everyone wants to give up seed oils and switch to olive oil, what would it take? And you're going to be amazed at this. You'd never guess how much more seed oil is made as opposed to olive oil. How many, how many more times do you think? I'm going to say double. 200. There's 200 times as much seed oil produced in the world as olive oil. And olive oil is not sustainably grown either. I've, I've had, over the years, I've had a lot of uh, volunteers help me on the farm and build the house and fencing and, and because they all want to learn about sustainable, sustainable food growing and that kind of stuff. One of them was from Sicily. He helped me build a pizza oven, as a matter of fact. And he said that in Sicily, there's so much money to be made from olive oil now that the whole of Sicily is covered in olive groves. And he said, it's just like a, just any other monocrop. It's just they've wrecked the island as far as he's concerned. Um, and, th and the same thing's kind of happening in Greece and Spain. And, and there's, lots of, there's lots of olives growing in Tasmania, as it turns out. I, I only buy uh, Australian olive oil now. I, because a lot of the stuff that comes from Europe is actually cut with seed oils. If you if you don't know what you're buying, um, so I only buy you know, extra virgin Australian olive oil, um, and some of it comes from Tasmanian olive. No, no one makes olive oil in Tasmania. It gets sent to the mainland and it comes back in in tins, bottles, or whatever. By the end of the decade, there probably won't be enough fossil fuels to produce the food that we are accustomed to, even mm. like all the rubbish food. So there could be food shortages as early as next year, especially with climate change. Like we're delving into all sorts of other issues here, but there's, there, there is simply not enough uh, carnivore food to go around, right? So, so someone will miss out. It's as simple as that. Um, on top of that, all the non-carnivore food is making people really sick, as as you and I both know. And I think we are starting to reach the stage where the health system can't cope with the amount of, you know, diabetes and, and all that other stuff. Um, and, and so 
unfortunately, I have no answers for this. Um, and, and all the people that I follow on these kinds of subjects are predicting that there's going to be a decline, a decline in population probably by the end of this decade already. So anyone who doesn't go carnivore uh, soon is going to be in big trouble. Um, and I'll, I'll have to tell you, I'm really glad I started this early, and that and that I've, I'm, I've luckily I've bought a farm where I can grow all my own meat. Um, hmm. So that's that's the bad news. Uh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, how like how have you been eating? So you're down to. Like you're fully carnivore now, and what yeah, what is a day of a day of eating like for you? Well, I had a steak at lunchtime today. Um, I often have bacon and eggs uh, at at lunchtime because I only eat twice a day at most. I, I skip breakfast altogether, so I, I, I fast from dinner time to to lunchtime. Um, except for my coffee, my morning coffee, I'll have it on cream. I've stopped, I've stopped consuming milk completely. Since finding out that cream doesn't affect your, um, uh, your blood glucose. Um, and, um, and then depending on, depending on how much activity, cause I, I'm, I'm very active here. Like I'm building new fences now. I've actually just, completely pulled down the vegetable garden. It had gone to pot anyway because while I was – because I built my own house. So the house you can see behind me, um, the, the block wall, um, I, I had a block layer to make those, but I, I designed and built the house. It's, it's super energy efficient, requires no heating or cooling all year round here in Tasmania. Um, so w while we had this big push to finish the house, I sort of gave up on the garden. And it went to pot, basically. And and um, it's a huge job to get it back to where it was, say, four years ago. And now I've decided it's just not worth it. I'm, I'm just not going to eat anything that comes out of it anyway. So I've, I've pulled it all down, and I'm going to put goats on it to eat all the weeds, and, and they can turn it into uh, milk and meat and whatever. Um, and so... Killing two birds with one stone, right? The goats will clean it up for you and then provide for, for food for exactly. you from that, right? I, I'm a, I'm a practice, practicing permaculturist. I don't know if you know about permaculture. It's, it's multitasking animals and plants and things to, to work your, your way. Um, some people would disagree that not having a vegetable garden is not permaculture, but I've got, I've got a meat garden instead. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, I mean, the thing is all the food for the animals around here is free. So we've got heaps of grass and I cut down like goats in particular, they're like eating trees. So I, I cut trees down saplings cause they're growing wild and, and they're overcrowded. So I cut them down and I just throw them over the fence and the goats just eat the trees. They eat the bark off the, off the limbs and everything. Um, and they make really good milk. Um, it's, um, it's got much less lactose in it than, than cow's milk. And it, the only problem with goats is that the, the meat is very lean. There's no fat on the meat. Um, but we've got sheep as well. So we've got, we've got about eight lambs that we're going to kill soon, hopefully. And we've got chickens, although, yeah, well, that's another story. We, we, we lost a lot of chickens because of, of bushfires that we had about five years ago. Um, but yeah, you know, we we can build all that back up, um, and we sort of we, we've had cattle here before, but our farm's not very big. So it's it's only it's only five hectares, uh, including the one hectare dam. So it's only four hectares. Um, so we could probably only raise two cows at a time here, and and maybe get them to calve once a year or something. So we've got. We're not, we're not, no problems with um, meat supply. Um, 
but, and, but now we've got all these fruit trees that we're not going to eat off. They're just going to, so we, we just feed the fruit to the animals. I mean, oh, okay. Got... So, so they're good with the stuff from the orchard too. Oh, yeah, yeah. especially the goats. Well, they, I mean, they all love it. Um, they'll eat fruit, you know, animals eat fruit. Um, I've still got, because I had to stop drinking alcohol as well. I used to make my own cider, which everyone just raved about. I opened the best cider they ever drank. But I've got, 120 litres of it in the shed that I haven't, I haven't done anything with yet. It's two years old. I mean, it's, it's going to be really good <laughs> if you're into alcohol. Um, but I just can't drink alcohol anymore. Um, you know, my, my system's just completely changed. Um, and I think, I think what happens is that you can abuse your body for years and years and years with, you know, plants and alcohol and whatever, and then eventually... It just spits the dummy and says, "That's it. I've had enough. I can't help you anymore. You're on your own." Um, yeah, I've reached my limits. You know, you you either change something or it's downhill from here, buddy. That's right. Yeah. Mm. How are friends and family when they when they find out that you're, you know, you've got a farm, you're raising meat, you're only eating meat and eggs. Um, is are they a little bit shocked or you know is this do they see this as well this is the way to go well my son and his wife or our son and his wife have actually recently moved to tasmania as well um i think they're half on side i think alex our son he's had some health issues that he's eating better than he used to his wife, not so much. Our daughter's still in Queensland, so she's got her own life up there. And and I mean, she's she's really interested in permaculture. She's on a permaculture course, so she's you know she's and she loves the farm, but I don't think she's ready to move down here yet. Um, yeah, it's to my son and his wife. They are prepared for the looming economic collapse. Which, which is going to be caused by the energy problems because, you know, we, we're going to start running out of oil. Well, I mean, we've been running out of oil since forever, but peak oil is now. Um, so the, the, the maximum amount of oil production ever will probably happen this year, and then it's downhill from there. With less and less oil, you can, you can, you're going to produce less and less food, as simple as that. In fact, there's all sorts of really weird things happening in Europe at the moment, where they they're trying to get they're, not, they're trying to stop people from uh, raising meat. Have you have you seen that? Yeah, which kind of goes against the fact that it, you know we should be doing the exact opposite. Yeah, um, and the farmers are up in arms, mind you. It's a real it's a really weird thing because the farmer see they they. This is stupid theory that animals cause climate change, and in fact, it's all sorts of other things. Um, and grazing animals are actually carbon neutral because they eat grass, and all the grass comes from carbon that's in the atmosphere. So the grass pulls the carbon out of the air; it grows into food. They turn that into meat, and we eat them. Um, but when you're looking at agriculture, it's all done with uh, oil and gas-based uh, fertilizers, and they're going to run out. So, so the amount of the amount of food that can be produced out of the ground that's not meat um, is is going to diminish. And 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 they're pushing plant-based everything in, which is just ridiculous. Um, I I just don't understand that. I I, I have huge arguments so with people about this. I mean, I'm sure in these food companies, there are probably a lot of, um, you know, people with MBAs running around that don't actually have any real world experience doing stuff, right? But I'm sure amongst all, all the people that work there, there must be some people that realize there's a looming problem. What what do you think they're thinking about all this? So you know, or, or are they just like, well, we'll just go full steam ahead, produce the food, and you know, worry about the consequences later? See, I think the problem is that 
most of these people aren't system thinkers. So all they see is that cows burp and cause greenhouse gases. And so they're part of the climate change problem. But the thing is, the, the greenery around us needs the carbon dioxide out of the air, like trees and grass, and now they all suck the carbon dioxide out of the air to make new grass and new trees. So the, so the cows are part of the cycle. In fact, all these animals are part of the cycle. They eat grass, they turn into meat, they poo at the end and urinate, and that fertilizes the ground. And in actual fact, I've seen it with my own eyes here. There are people who do regenerative grazing in Tasmania and all over the world, but, but, but the ones I've seen have been in Tasmania. And they actually, they're growing soil. But there's one local farmer here. Um, he's like, I don't know, fifth generation Tasmanian farmer. And uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I can't remember exactly when, his, his father started complaining that all these rocks were appearing out of the ground and they couldn't cut grass to make hay. Anyway, his son, who's into regenerative uh, grazing, which is what it's called, he worked out that it was because they weren't uh, recycling the nutrients properly. So there's, there's a special way of doing all of this, which is beyond the realms of this particular uh, podcast, I suppose. But you can actually grow soil if, if you do it properly. So if you move the, the cows every day, for, so you, you get them in a strip, you might, be, you might have 50 cows on I don't know, an acre of land per day. Then you move them sideways onto a new acre of land and where they've been is covered in cow shit and urine and, and squash grass and, and all of that fertilizer and it makes new soil. And he, he, when he worked that out, he said that within five years, the rocks disappeared because what happened was that all these rocks were coming out of the ground. I mean, they'd been below the ground and now they were out of the ground because the ground had been eroded. And, and so he's been rebuilding new soil and real rich soil for 20 years now. And this is a new thing that's happening now. It's called regenerative grazing, um, which is the opposite of what all these monoculture farms that grow wheat and, and you know, all the stuff that's making us all sick. Um, they've got to abandon that and start, and start growing cattle and other animals to rebuild the soil. I mean, in Amer America is a classic case. When the white man first went to America, the topsoil in the prairies was like six meters thick. It was incredible. They, they just they had no idea what the resort. That's why America is so rich, by the way. They had all the resources that every that every other civilization had depleted over the, over millennia, because the American Indians they lived sustainably, so they moved on. They, they didn't stay in one place and build cities and do all the stuff that we do. And so the soil in America was really deep and rich. It was all, all, it was all built up from animals and also glaciation from, from 10, 20, 30,000 years ago. Yeah, glaciation caused all this soil to build up and also millions of bison roaming around the prairies in America and shitting everywhere just built up this huge amount of soil, which the Indians never, uh, never used because they, they weren't growing crops like us white people do um and and it's it's the animal manure that that does the trick you see so it's possible to grow lots of meat instead of all the other garbage which is making us all sick um it's just that the the, the grain system now the wheat and you know all the, the rice and everything else and all the canola to make oil, which is total rubbish oil. Um, all of that, like I remember, I was in Canada, I don't know, how long ago we were in Canada? 40 years ago. Um, it was covered in canola, like yellow fields as far as the eye could see. Um, and all of that's just completely unsustainable because they, they use artificial uh, fertilizers. It's killed with fossil fuels. But when the fossil fuels go away, that's the end of artificial fertilizers and all the machines and transportation. You know, food, food often comes from halfway around the world. Um, I mean, he, like, um, what's the, I, I used to eat bananas here. 
until I found out how much sugar was in them. Um, but they, you can't grow bananas in Tasmania. You have, you have to come from up north, northern Australia. And they move food like that all over the world, and it's only possible with fossil fuels. So when the fossil fuels run out, the food system is going to be in serious trouble. Um, so we have to grow all our stuff locally. And, and luckily, growing meat locally is a piece of cake. You know, I remember the, the first time we, we killed a whole lot of our lambs, I said to my wife, well, geez, that was a lot easier than growing veggies. You know, we, we get a local butcher, a mobile butcher. He, he comes on the property. They, they shoot the animals. They hang them up, skin them, and then they hang them for a week in a, a mobile fridge. You know, like a big a big fridge on the back of a trailer, and then they cut them all up and and they, and it's and it's that's the other thing too is dirt cheap. You know, like we get meat for six dollars a kilo, and it's prime. It's our meat. It's organic. It's grass fed. Um, it's the most beautiful stuff you can eat, and it's dirt cheap. So, but people won't listen to anything I say. Um, so, so where is this going? Like, what's what? What does it look like ten years from now? Oh, I wish I wasn't such a doomer, but I, I don't see it going well. Um, because, see, we're we're also running out of the fossil fuels that they use, or well, spe specifically oil that they use for running all these farms. And, and I think that's one reason why in Europe, you know, they, they want to stop people from having animals because I don't know why they, they seem to think that running animal farms is bad for the animal. Because everyone blames climate change on cows, but it's not cows that are doing it. It's humans. Humans are causing climate change, not cows. Um, I don't know where this is going, but it's, it's not going to end well. That's, that's all I'm worried about. It's awesome to hear that you're doing better. I'd love to get you back on once you get um, your future results. Um, if people want to reach out to you, do you have a, a YouTube or Instagram or a Facebook or anything? Um, I've got a website which I've been ignoring for some time now because I've kind of run out of things to say. I, I, I actually put a, quite a few posts on it when I discovered the the, um, the new diet, eat meat and nothing else. <laughs> but it's amazing the pushback I'm getting. Like people just, they're not interested. Like they just don't want to change. But it's called Damn the Matrix. It's been running for quite a long time. I, I used to write about oil depletion and climate change and energy. Uh, I'm a bit of an energy nut. You know, but this whole house runs on solar power alone. It, you know, we, because um, I, I, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe more. I did a diploma in renewable energy technology, thinking that renewable energy would save the world, but now I realize that it can't. Um, you know, we're just, we're just going to have to live more simply so we can simply live. Um, and, you know, it's buying, like when you walk into a supermarket and you see the aisles and aisles and aisles upon aisles of just rubbish food that, that all these companies are manufacturing, like you go to the meat section and it's like, it's not even 10%. Um, and that's that's the only place I, like if I'm going to buy any food, I just walk straight to the meat thing, which is right on the back of the shop and just grab a few steaks and, you know, because you can buy legs of lamb at the moment in, in Tasmania for $7 a kilo. It's dirt cheap because there's too many lambs. I can't get rid of them. So I can't resist that. So I'll, I'll, I'll just buy a few legs of lamb, stick them in the freezer and just eat them as I go. Um, but, you know, so much of the stuff in the shops is imported from the mainland, the big island up north, or even overseas. I mean, you know, in winter, you you can't, you can, you can get bananas all year round in it here, but they're not even grown in Australia in, in wintertime. They've got to come from somewhere else. I don't know where they get them from, but it's got to be the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and everyone takes this for granted. Like this is just normal. You can just walk, walk into any shop, any time of the year and buy some bananas. No, no one ever thinks about where their food comes from. At least I've been doing that for quite some time, for, for many, for 20 years actually. 
because uh, I've been growing our own food for I don't know, at least that long, on and off. Um, now, we were in the subtropics before coming to Queensland, but coming to uh, Tasmania, uh, we were in Queensland. That's why I said Queensland. Uh, but, um, you know, we, there are no banana farms in Tasmania. There's no pineapple farms. There's no mango farms. But you can buy, you can buy those things here nearly all the time. Mike, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and, I'll, and I'd love to come back on because I'm, I'm planning in the next few months, couple of months, to have more blood tests and, and to see how I'm improving now on the carnivore diet.